So welcome to the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California. My name is Sumbul Ali Kara Mali, and I'm going to be your host for this evening's Islam and Authors program. Islam and Authors is a series of conversations with authors of books relating to Islam and Muslims. Um, future, we have future um, events, which will feature Salahuddin Khan, author of Sikandar, and Kabir and Camille Helminski, authors of the Rumi Day book. So we hope that you'll come to those events as well. And please do check the um, iccnc.org website for more information. Our sponsors tonight are the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union, the Council for American Islamic Relations, Illum Magazine, Abrahamic Vision, the Islamic Scholarship Fund, and the Arab Film Festival. So we'd like to thank them. So our guest tonight is Dr. Omid Safi, who is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He earned his BA, MA, and PhD in religion, all from Duke University. I was wondering if he would have a southern accent, but he doesn't. <laughs> his, <laughs> his specific areas of expertise include contemporary Islamic thought, the history of the Islamic Middle East in the medieval period, Rumi, Persian poetry, and Islamic mysticism. He's been nominated many times for university-wide teaching awards um, and has given hundreds of talks to audiences ranging from university professors to first graders. It was the first graders I was particularly uh, impressed with. He's the chair for the study of Islam at the American Academy of Religion and a member of the advisory board of the Pluralism Project at Harvard University. His recent book is called Memories of Muhammad, Why the Prophet Matters. It's his third book. Um, tonight, what we'll do is Professor Safi will give a talk for about half an hour, and then we'll have an onstage conversation for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to question and answer. So please help me welcome Professor Safi. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you for taking time out on a, on a what day is it? Monday? Uh, Monday evening. There's a lot of uh, good things to do on, uh, on a Monday evening, on every evening. And uh, one of the biggest gifts that people can ever offer you is um, the gift of their time. So I make a point of uh, starting each and every talk that I ever give by thanking people for the gift of their time. Because of all the things that we own in life, um, time is the one commodity that is absolutely in finite measure. You can give away your clothes, you can give away money, you could give away books, although that's kind of difficult for some of us. Um, but, but time is one of those things that once you've spent it a certain way, there's no getting it back. So when um, one person, two people, a gathering decide to give you uh, an hour or so of their time, uh, my um, commitment to you, to me, to us, is to make sure that we spend that time beautifully, inshallah. And if so, um, aided by God, that we come away from this gathering kinder, firmer, stronger, and more compassionate towards each other and the world that, that we live in. I think I'm supposed to talk about this book, and I think I will at some point, but I actually want to ask a bigger question. Um, to be honest with you, I don't really care if you buy this book or not. Um, it would be nice if you read it, but that's not even necessary. What I really would like to spend our time talking and thinking about is the recognition of the fact that the world around us is changing. And it's changing remarkably rapidly. There are events going on in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Oakland, in New York, all around the world 
that a year, a year and a half ago would have been unthinkable. Unthinkable. Make no mistake about it, we live in difficult days. The times are hard. We have 9% of our population that is unemployed in this country. It would be higher than that, but many people have stopped looking for jobs because they think there are no jobs to be found. I was spending time today with a friend of mine from South Africa who was telling me that the unemployment rate there is 38%. And in Gaza, of course, it is 50%. Our economy is broken. Our healthcare system is kaput. Our schools are messed up. The environment is polluted and so are our hearts. But in a tradition that was started by Dr. King, I want to give thanks to God for allowing us to live in this age and to live in these days. And that might seem like a crazy thing to say when you look around and you see everything that's going on. Particularly for those of us who are Muslim or have friends who are Muslim or care about the dignity of people, we see all around us every day from Fox News and talk show radio a kind of venom being spewed towards Muslims, towards Hispanics, towards gays and lesbians that is unfathomable. And the real question that in the time that I have that I would like to ask is where would our prophet stand in an age of the Occupy movement? Where would he be found? Where would Jesus be? Well, come on, I've got to take 30 minutes to get to that point. So, you know, don't go to my slide. Um, And... That question of what do we do with our religious heroes, with our religious exemplars, is a really important one. So let me give you an example from much closer to our times and from much closer to the American context. And then I want to come back to the example of the Prophet Muhammad. And the example that I want to start out with is the example of Martin, Dr. King. Martin, in a Christian tradition, is what they would call a representative of the prophetic tradition. And the word prophetic sometimes makes us Muslims feel a little awkward because we're like, but the prophet is the last prophet. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a prophetic tradition in the sense of someone who delivers to a society God's message. And if you study the Bible, if you study the Torah, if you study the New Testament, if you study the Quran, you can ask yourself the question of what does a prophet do? What does a prophet say? How does a prophet act? Read the Bible and study the episode and for that matter, read the Sirah the life history of our beloved prophet and study what does a prophet do when God's call first comes to them. In the Bible, a lot of the prophets are like, dear Lord, not me. I have a, I'm a nice Jewish boy. I've got a nice little plan for my life. I'm going to be a CPA, an attorney, a doctor, <laughs> anything but a prophet. Because what is it that a prophet is supposed to do? Does a prophet go up to his or her community and say, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. God loves the way you're treating the poor, the orphans and the widows. Status quo, baby. Don't 
change a thing. God loves you. <laughs> no. No. No prophet comes to his or her community and says, status quo. Every prophet comes and delivers the same message. You have forgotten about God, and in the process, you have forgotten what it means to live as noble humans. You have become unjust, and you are treating the least of you the worst. Repent now, or the judgment of the Lord is upon you. Now, when a prophetic figure shows up in a society in that small p sense, again, not Rasul, not Nabi, small p, prophet, the society, the establishment, has a few strategies of dealing with them. As Gandhi says, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. If ignoring you, laughing at you, fighting you don't work, the powers that be, the establishment, has one ultimate trump card up their sleeve. And this is the meanest, nastiest trick that the invested authorities have. And the last trick to defeat a prophet is to take a prophet, someone who challenges you at the core of your moral, social, spiritual, political being. You take a prophet and you make him into an icon. When you make someone into an icon, they are no longer a human who is standing in front of you delivering God's challenge. They become someone to be elevated, put up on a pedestal, adored and admired, maybe even worshipped. But that icon no longer presents a moral, social political, theological challenge to get you to rethink your fundamental place in this society. So, let's take a look at a couple of icons and then ask the question about our beloved. Let's start with Malcolm. Brother Malcolm. By any means necessary, Malcolm. He's now a stamp. He gets licked a million times a day. And the man ships him all over the country. Spike Lee makes a movie about him, puts a trademark on his name, and hundreds of people start walking around with a, I'm Malcolm X. No, you're wearing Malcolm X's t-shirt without embodying Malcolm X's challenge. <coughs> if Malcolm presented a threat, a challenge to this society, how much more so about Martin? I have four children, alhamdulillah, and I've gotten to see my children come up through the American elementary school system, middle school system, high school system, and now beginning college. There is only one picture of Martin that they've ever seen in their life. And that's Dr. King from the March on Washington, I Have a Dream. They've had a VHS of that put into their VHS players in social sciences classes. As my son rolls his eyes and says, Baba, it's a VHS. <laughs> Who watches a freaking VHS today? It's not even like on YouTube. <laughs> and that's where it ends. It's the Martin, the black Jesus 
of racial equality. But there's a Martin that is censored. There's a Martin that's absent from our consciousness. And that Martin is the Martin of Riverside Church. It's the Martin that ponders deep in his heart not only the question of racial injustice in this country, but the connection between racial injustice, economic injustice, and America's warmongering enterprise around the world. And he comes to the conclusion, reluctantly, but he does, in Riverside Church in New York, when he begins by saying, I have come to this magnificent house of worship because my conscience no longer permits me to remain silent. There comes a time where silence is betrayal and for us that time is now. That Martin names what he calls the triple giant evils of American society. And what are they? Racism is still number one. Materialism. He says, we have changed from being a person-oriented society to a thing-oriented society. If that was true in 1967, what about 2011? Right? How many of us go anywhere without these little <laughs> idols? You want an idol? This is an idol. Used to be a <laughs> right? And then the third one, racism, materialism, militarism. That, Martin says, I will never again raise my voice against the violence in the ghetto without simultaneously speaking about the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. In 1967, we're talking about Vietnam. In 2011, we're talking about Iraq with probably a million casualties that we have left behind. We're talking about Afghanistan, which is in a worse condition than it has been. And if the crazies have their way, probably Iran as well. We are not only talking about war, we're talking about the war-mongering industry. We're talking about the military-industrial complex. We're talking about how we spend more than the next 20 countries combined on our military spending. We, as a country, paid attention to Jeremiah Wright. You remember him? The cool little slightly crazy pastor of Obama that Obama like threw under the bus? Because what did he say? God damn America. And we couldn't wait to just be done with him. What did Martin talk about? And I'll tell you what Martin has to do with the prophet in just a second. Martin said, a nation that spends more on the military than it does on programs of social uplift has already approached spiritual death. Right? That's a Martin, that's a prophet, small p, that we don't want to deal with. So what do we do? Let's name a street in every town, Martin Luther King Boulevard. Let's have a holiday that Reagan didn't want called the Martin Luther King holiday. And let's even build a monument built by Chinese artists <laughs> in Washington, D.C. Nice. Let's have a black man in the middle of the row of white dudes on the mall in Washington. About time. But the monument to Martin is an icon. It's the black Jesus that we're supposed to venerate and not be challenged by. I want to come back after talking about this to now talking about our prophet, the beloved prophet Muhammad. And I want to make a similar critique here. 
that we as Muslims who love the Prophet, adore the Prophet, venerate the Prophet, sometimes can't get through a talk without adding Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, right? And I still say that inside my heart each time that I mention his name or I touch my heart to remind myself of that. We have turned the Prophet of Islam into an icon instead of being perpetually challenged by the moral, spiritual, theological, and political challenge that he represents to us individually and collectively, let me talk for a little bit about what that means.